Hey guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. My name is April and today we are going to be talking about osteoarthritis. Now this is going to be a little bit more than just quick pathophysiology. We are going to talk about not only pathophysiology, but also about some medical treatments and nursing care related to osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is a degenerative joint disease and it is characterized by progressive deterioration of the articular cartilage. Now it is non-inflammatory except maybe at the localized area, so of the knee, of the shoulder, of the hands, and it is considered a non-systemic disorder. Now, what we have is the cartilage and then the bone beneath the cartilage that are eroded, and osteophytes, also called bone spurs, are forming, and this is resulting in narrowed joint spaces. So how do we prevent osteoarthritis? Well, good joint-saving measures is a great place to start, so good body mechanics, labor-saving devices, so all of those things that we we teach you to do as nurses that prevent injury, save your back, all of those good body mechanics and ergonomic maneuvers. Maintaining a healthy weight that will help to reduce the strain on the hips and the knees and the ankle joints. So avoiding or limiting any activity that puts a repetitive strain on the joints and then using well-fitted shoes with supports. Now, of course, we are going to see some joint deterioration as we age and osteoarthritis is most common in adults over the age of 60 years. There is a genetic component to osteoarthritis, and we also know that joint injury due to that acute or repetitive strain is a very, very common cause of osteoarthritis. We've talked about maintaining a healthy weight, therefore obesity is a risk factor for osteoarthritis and other metabolic disorders such as diabetes mellitus and sickle cell disease also contribute to osteoarthritis. So let's talk about the clinical manifestations of osteoarthritis. So this could be joint pain and stiffness. This could manifest as limping due to hip or knee pain. It could also be vertebral pain that is going to be due to cervical or lumbar compression. It can also be chronic low back pain. Of course, with palpation and range of motion, the patient will also experience pain. We might also see muscle atrophy, loss of function of that joint, and therefore the client is really restricting their activity. Crepitus, that can be palpated or even heard when the joint is manipulated. The joint could also be enlarged. This is going to be due to bone hypertrophy. Synovitis is inflammation of the synovial fluid, and that is going to indicate advanced disease. And then of course we could have joint effusion. This is going to be excessive joint fluid. Okay, so there are two different types of nodes that we will see with osteoarthritis. The first one is Heberding's nodes, and these are going to be enlargement at the distal interphalangeal joints, and you can see those in this picture right here, so Herberdine's nodes. And then we also have Bouchard's nodes, and these are located at the proximal interphalangeal joints, and you can see this one in the image right here. Osteoarthritis is not a symmetrical disorder, but these nodes may occur bilaterally, so we might see them on both sides of the body. The nodes are very painful and they do become inflamed. So there's that localized inflammation that we see with osteoarthritis. As far as laboratory and diagnostic tests, now we can see an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein. Those laboratory tests are always going to be elevated when there's inflammation in the body. So of course, we're going to see those in osteoarthritis secondary to synovitis. So that inflammation of the synovial fluid. We can also look at x-rays to determine any joint changes that have occurred. And then CT scans and MRIs can examine in particular the knees and the vertebral joints looking for damage from osteoarthritis. For nursing care, we do have both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic pain relief. So we want to assist the client to determine what is an acceptable pain level and then using both medications, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, and non-pharmacologic support, we want to achieve the best pain relief possible. These clients are also going to need psychosocial support. That is going to be related to body image changes, but then most importantly related to an altered ability to perform just normal activities of daily living or any other normal activities that the client wanted to perform or used to perform that now maybe they have the limited ability to perform. We do want to teach joint protection to these clients. So some examples might be using both hands to hold an object, not just one hand, bending at the knees instead of bending at the waist to try to pick up large items, and then using large joints 
to manipulate or to perform activities rather than very small joints. We also, as nurses, want to assess the need for assistive or adaptive devices. So this could be mobility aids like walkers, canes, or crutches. And then it could also be just adaptive devices like clothing with Velcro closures. For client education, we want to teach clients to balance activity with rest. So we do want clients to be active every day. That keeps the joint in motion, but we do want them to rest, especially more rest when they are having exacerbations or painful episodes with the joint. Now we can teach the client to use both heat and cold therapy. So heat is going to be used to relieve tenderness and stiffness. So that could be hot bath showers. We can also use hot packs and moist heating pads. Now we do want to teach the client to avoid very high temperatures because these could lead to burning of the skin. Cold therapy on the other hand is going to be used to reduce inflammation and to numb nerve endings, which will also provide pain relief. If if you do have a client using cold therapy, we do want to limit that to 20 minutes in contact with the skin. And you want to make sure that you have wrapped that ice pack or that, that cold pack in a, a cloth before placing it on the skin that would avoid burning of the skin. We want to teach clients to maintain functional position of the joint. That's going to be achieved through good posture, proper weight distribution, small pillows under the head when laying down to prevent hyperflexion or hyperextension of the neck. And then really important, we want to make sure to teach clients not or to prop the joints in a flexed position. So that means no pillows under the knees when you're lying down. Again, achieving a healthy weight is really important, especially for taking the strain off of the lower body joints and then following a prescribed exercise regimen. So remember, active exercise is always going to be better than passive exercise. So we do want these clients clients exercising on a daily basis. Of course, though, we do want balance of that activity with rest for the joint. As far as medication, so there are lots of medications that we use to treat osteoarthritis, but first and foremost, we're going to start with acetaminophen. This is the medication of choice for osteoarthritis. Now, the maximum is 4,000 milligrams in 24 hours. That's the absolute maximum. However, remember most of these clients who have osteoarthritis are older clients. So we tend to cap that maximum at 3,000 milligrams in 24 hours to prevent liver toxicity. Now it is important to remind clients that if they're taking an opioid medication, that opioids often have acetaminophen in them. So they'll be taking a medication that's hydrocodone or oxycodone and acetaminophen. So therefore they need to be careful about taking extra acetaminophen that they don't breach that three to 4,000 milligrams in 24 hours. There are some topical medications. So lidocaine patches are often used. It's a 5% lidocaine. Now it's important that clients who are taking anti-dysrhythmic medications not use a lidocaine patch. Other topicals will be salicylates and buspirone. These can come in gels, patches, creams, and they are applied directly to the painful joint. We can also use NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, Celecoxib, naproxen, and ibuprofen are all NSAIDs, and these are used for pain that is unrelieved by acetaminophen and also unrelieved by topical agents or if that synovitis is present. Synovitis does increase the pain associated with osteoarthritis, and we might need increased medications. Now, of course, we already mentioned opioids. Hydrocodone, oxycodone are often used used uh, when opioids are necessary, although we do want to try to avoid opioids if possible, and we really only want to be using them for short term. Now, of course, you do have clients, especially with maybe chronic back pain that may be taking long term opioids, but for the most part, we do want to limit those to short term only. And then we also might see a client taking muscle relaxant. These are going to be used for muscle spasms. However, we really need to use these in caution with older adults. They can cause confusion. There are some complementary and alternative therapies that I'm sure you've heard about in relation to osteoarthritis. So the first one is going to be capsaicin, and this is topical. So this provides temporary pain relief by blocking some pain impulses. It's applied directly to the painful joint up to four times a day. It's important to teach clients to wear gloves during application and then to wash hands immediately. Now, of course, if it is the hand, the joints of the hand that are painful, then of course the client can't wear gloves to apply the topical capsaicin to the hands, but we only want to leave this medication in contact with the hands for 30 minutes. And then we do want to teach the client to wash their hands. Really important that we avoid contact with the face and the eyes. And it is important to teach clients 
clients that a burning sensation after application is normal. The more they use the capsaicin, that burning sensation will subside. Also, glucosamine and chondroitin. These are supplements that aid in repair and maintenance of cartilage. Now, dosing for both of these is going to be based on weight, and it is important to teach clients to consult with the healthcare provider about the correct dosing for these supplements. Now, glucosamine reduces inflammation. It does have some adverse effects such as GI upset, rash, headaches, and drowsiness. And we want to teach clients that they should not take glucosamine if they are being treated for hypertension or if they are pregnant or lactating. Now, chondroitin actually strengthens the cartilage. So glucosamine reduces inflammation and chondroitin strengthens the cartilage. There are some adverse effects of chondroitin as well. This is going to mainly be increased bleeding if the client is also taking an anticoagulant or an NSAID. So we have to be careful um, in combination with those other medications. As far as therapeutic procedures, there are really only two. The first is intraarticular injections. So this is where glucocorticoids or hyaluronic acid is actually injected into the joint. Now, glucocorticoids are used to treat that localized inflammation. So they help with pain, but the client can have no more than four injections per year in one joint. Hyaluronic acid is used to replace the body's natural hyaluronic acid, which is just destroyed by joint inflammation. So we're just replacing the substance that's been destroyed through that joint deterioration. And then of course, the end result of osteoarthritis is total joint arthroplasty or replacement of the joint. So when all other measures have failed, total joint replacement might be necessary. And that's really going to be used solely to relieve the chronic pain of osteoarthritis, but then also to improve mobility and quality of life. Okay, guys, so that's all I have for you today as far as content about osteoarthritis. But I do have three questions that we are going to look at to check your understanding of this information. So remember, you can always pause the video if you feel like you need more time to look at answer options. The first question is, a nurse is assessing a client who has osteoarthritis arthritis of the knees and fingers, which findings are expected? And this is a select all that apply. Okay, so correct answers for this question are Herberden's nodes, enlarged joint size, and limping when walking. So let's look at the incorrect answer options. So B, swelling of all joints. Now that is going to be seen in rheumatoid arthritis. So if you are struggling with the difference between RA and OA, I do have a product in my Etsy shop that might help you. I will link a direct link to it in the description box below, and you can check out the differences between RA and OA. But one of the main differences is in OA, we only see localized inflammation. So very specific to the joint that is experiencing problems. However, in rheumatoid arthritis, remember that is an autoimmune disorder, you will see generalized. And then C, as an incorrect answer option, small body frame. That is a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis. However, we've already talked about with osteoarthritis, it is obesity that is the risk factor for OA. Next question, a nurse is providing education to a client with osteoarthritis of the hip and knee. Which information should the nurse include in the teaching? And this is again, a select all that apply. Okay, so correct answers to this question are going to be to apply heat to the joint to alleviate pain, reduce the amount of exercise done on days with increased pain, and active range of motion is more effective than passive range of motion. Let's look at the incorrect answer options. So for B, ice inflamed joints for 45 minutes following activity. Remember, we do need to limit ice to 20 minutes. And then D, prop the knees with the pillow while in bed. We do want to avoid repetitive flexion of the joints, especially of the knee joints. So we do not want to place that pillow under the knees when in bed. Okay, last question. A nurse is providing information about the use of capsaicin cream to a client who reports knee pain from osteoarthritis. Which information should the nurse include in the teaching?
a best answer to this question is wear gloves when applying the cream to the knees. Let's look at the incorrect answer options. A, continuous pain relief can be expected. Capsaicin is only going to provide temporary pain relief, not continuous. C, burning of the skin is an adverse effect. Note, we know that burning is an expected side effect. And D, apply the medication every two hours. Capsaicin cream should can only be applied up to four times daily. Okay, guys, hopefully you found this discussion about osteoarthritis helpful. Now, remember, if you are trying to differentiate between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, I do have a link in the description box below to a compare and contrast study guide where you can see the two disorders side by side in a table, literally just comparing and contrasting the differences. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below, or you can reach out to me via email. I can also be found on Twitter and Instagram. I do post over there daily. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video.